Um, so thank you for the introduction. And I'd also like to just thank James and Brian for organizing the seminar series uh, and giving me the opportunity to share our work despite the lockdown. Um, so as James said, I'm Nicole Pryor. I'm a postdoc in the lab of Marichal Huck at the University of Cambridge. And today I'll talk to you about liver organoids with a focus on liver development. Um, so let me just get rid of that. Um, so organoids are increasingly used by researchers now, and that's because they represent a more physiological in vitro model than traditional 2D cell cultures. They are derived from a variety of stem cell or progenitor cells, um, including embryonic stem cells, induced pluripotent stem cells, or can be isolated from tissue um, from, for, from embryos or adult tissues. And then these progenitors are placed in culture media, which are supplemented with specific growth factors, which enable their self-organization into 3D cell clusters. In many cases, they can self-renew. And importantly, these cell clusters recapitulate, at least to some extent, the organ of origin functionality. Now, the first organoid system was described back in 2009, and that was for the intestine. So you can see that a lot of progress has been made in the last 10 or so years. And there are now organoid systems described for, a, a, for many, many different tissues throughout the body. And today we'll be focused on the liver. So the liver is a complex organ and it's made up of many different cell types. But the functional cells are the epithelial cells, the hepatocytes and the ductal cells, also known as cholangiocytes. And the liver is um, structured into these liver lobules in which you have the central vein in the middle surrounded by hepatocytes here in pink, which radiate outwards towards the portal triad. And in the portal triad, you find the hepatic artery, the portal vein, and the bile ducts. So the hepatocytes make up the majority of the liver volume and are responsible for most of the functions you think of when you think of the liver, such as detoxification, production of bile, um, and storage for energy metabolism. The ductal cells um, are important for collecting the bile produced by the hepatocytes and then draining that to the gallbladder for use later on in digestion. Now, for those of you who were here last week, we heard about the intestine, which was a very fast renewing um, organ, which renews in the space of about three to five days. The liver is very different to this, and actually in homeostasis, cellular turnover of the liver is very slow and is largely maintained by differentiated cells. Yet, and quite incredibly, the liver is the only visceral organ capable of regeneration. And the type of regeneration depends on the type of damage inflicted on the liver. So for example, in the case of a, case of a partial hepatectomy, two thirds of the liver can be removed and the hepatocytes in the remaining portion of the liver will re-enter the cell cycle, undergo mass proliferation and can regenerate the volume of the liver within about two to three weeks. Um, and this is a great transplant the basis for live in a transplant of the liver. However, there's other types of damage the liver can be exposed to, including uh, chronic injury from damaging agents such as alcohol, virus, or accumulation of fat. And in these cases, these damaging agents actually uh, inhibit the um, hepatocytes so they can no longer undergo this mass proliferation. Yet the liver can still regenerate and this is due to action of the ductal cells undergoing what's known as the ductular reaction. So that can be visualized here. So toxic damage can be inflicted on the liver. The ductal cells uh, in response to this damage will massively upregulate the SWINT target gene called LGR5 and these cells will then go on to regenerate both hepatocytes and ductal cells. And what was a uh, key back in 2013 was Marichal Hook found that you could isolate these um, damaged cells that had uh, upregulated LGR5, place them in 3D culture, and these could go on to form adult ductal liver organoids. And actually, these ductal cells could then be induced to differentiate into hepatocytes by changing the culture medium. And not only that, but they don't have to be damaged. This can actually be derived, the ductal organoids, from healthy ductal cells as well. Now, recent data from the lab, this is work uh, spearheaded by Luigi Loya in the lab, um, compared the transcriptional changes 
of the ductular reaction in vitro by isolating ductal cells and placing them in 3D culture compared to the ductular reaction in vivo upon induction of damage by a toxic diet. And what Luigi found was actually that transcriptional changes in vitro of the ductal reaction are highly similar to those found in vivo. And in fact, 71% of the transcriptional changes in vivo overlap with those in vitro, um, implying that this is actually a very good model of the ductal reaction in vitro. Um, and then Luigi goes on in his paper to, uh, to show that um, TEP1 mediated epigenetic remodeling is required for li liver regeneration. And I would strongly encourage you to go and look more at his work. So what we have is we have adult liver organoids, which can be derived both from mouse, and the system is also established for humans, that can produce ductal cells, which can then be differentiated into hepatocytes. Effectively, a differentiated ductal cell becomes a bipotent progenitor, which gives rise to both hepatocytes and ductal cells. And my question was, is this simply a regenerative phenomenon or is this actually recapitulating something that happens earlier on in liver development? So when we look at liver development, here we have a generic embryo. Um, the way the liver develops is seven days post vitalization, we get specification of the endoderm. And depending on where on the anterior posterior axis, the different endodermal progenitors will give rise to different organs in the adult. So here we have the liver, which derives from the uh, hepatic progenitors, the hepatoblasts. And actually, both the ductal cells and the hepatocytes derive from this common hepatoblast progenitor. So that was being shown at the population level, but it's still not, it wasn't known if like what we see in vitro, can a single cell give rise to both ductal cells and hepatocytes in vivo? And um, previously, the hepato hepatoblasts were regarded as a homogenous population, so they all had the same potential, and they initiated their differentiation later on at E13.5. So my question was, can we actually identify a truly bipotent hepatoblast, a single cell that gives rise to both ductal cells and hepatocytes? And can we get more information about the dynamics of liver differentiation? So in order to do that, we need to find markers of liver hepatoblasts. And to be specific for the liver and not for other endodermal um, organs, especially when we consider the pancreas and the liver derived from a common progenitor. So RNA sequencing from 2013 showed that in the developing liver, LGR5 is highly expressed whereas it's not expressed in developing pancreas at the same time point. So we thought this could be a key um, marker for hepatoblasts and we wanted to explore that. So to do that, we use linear tracing, whereby we combined a fluorescent reporter, which is FLOX, so it's not expressed, with an LGR5 Cre ERT2. In this way, upon induction of tamoxifen at a specific time point, those cells which are LGR5 positive will have the activated the tamoxifen and will lead to expression of this fluorescent reporter and then all the descendants of that cell will also be fluorescently uh, labeled. So in this way we can induce labeling at 9.5, wait a few days, collect the embryo two days later and see do we have LGO5 positive cells in the embryo and what type of cells are they. So when we do that and we collect the embryos at E11.5 we see many red cells, so these are cells that were derived from cells that were LGO5 positive at 9.5, and we can ask what type of cells are they? And we see there is always co-staining with the hepatoblast marker AFP, implying they are hepatoblasts, and we don't see co-staining with markers of other lineages, such as endothelial lineages or hematopoietic lineages, and we find more than 50% of them are proliferative. So this implies that the LGO5 positive cells at 9.5 are hepatoblasts, but the way we can test that is then looking in the adult to see do we see labelled cholangiocytes, ductal cells, and hepatocytes. So that's what we've done in this experiment. We've got the labelled cell with the LGO5 pre-ERT2. We induce linear tracing at 9.5 and collect the adult liver. And what you see here is the trace cells in red and we have hepatocytes, you can tell that based on their morphology, but also ductal cells. And you can see that with the co-staining of osteopontin. 
So now we have a marker of hepatoblasts that we can use and we can go further now and ask, do, can a single hepatoblast give rise to both ductal cells and hepatocytes? And we do that using a slightly different fluorescent reporter called confetti. So in this case, with the confetti reporter, upon the action of Cree, the uh, recombination will lead to one of the four fluorescent reporters being expressed. So if we use a low enough um, dose of tamoxifen, we can ensure we only get clonal labeling of the hepatoblasts. Um, and in this way, we can ask, is it a bipotent hepatoblast, i.e. do we get hepatocytes and ductal cells labeled in the same color? Or are hepatoblasts unipotent? So hepatocytes are only labeled in one color and ductal cells are labeled in a different color. And what you can see here with the linear tracing induced at 9.5 is these are the trace cells and we see both hepatocytes here, you can base, see based on their morphology, and ductal cells, and you can see that as they co-stain with osteopontin here, marked by the arrows. So indeed, we have evidence that hepatoblasts, a single hepatoblast, can give rise to both ductal cells and hepatocytes. So now we have that. Is this the case for all hepatoblasts, or are there subpopulations of hepatoblasts? So to look into that, we use single-cell RNA sequencing of E10.5 livers. Um, and we sequenced them and we found there is transcriptional heterogeneity within the hepatoblast population. And in fact, we get these three clusters, we get these proliferating hepatoblasts, we get some, even though it's very early on, E10.5, that are already becoming ductal committed and some which are already on a hepatocyte trajectory. And we see that the majority of our LGR5 positive hepatoblasts are in this proliferating hepatoblast cluster, the, uh, the early bipotential ones. So we see there is transcriptional heterogeneity within the hepatoblasts. So where are these LGR5 hepatoblasts in the hierarchy? Are they at the apex, i.e. does the LGR5 positive hepatoblast give rise to all the hepatocytes and the ductal cells? Or are they somewhere further down? And the way we uh, reasoned we could look into this was to look at the proportion of the labelled cells from LGR5 um, labelled hepatoblasts. So our theory was if LGR5 is at the apex, the proportion of labelled hepatocytes and ductal cells will be the same as the proportion of hepatocytes and ductal cells in the adult liver. So we quantified that and found that in a normal adult mouse liver, 3% of the epithelial cells are ductal. Um, so if LGR5 is at the top, we'd expect to get this. However, if LGR5 is not at the top, we'll get some other proportion. So we did the lineage tracing, um, both from the LGR5 Cree to answer our question, and also from a Rosa Cree, which is a neutral driver, which would label all hepatoblasts, both the LGR5 positive ones and the LGR5 negative ones. And when we look at the proportions, what we find is the proportions of label results in 3% of ductal cells labelled. Um, so it's the same as a homeostatic proportion, implying that the LGR5 hepatoblast is at the apex of the hierarchy, whereas using Rosacre, we get a higher proportion of ductal cells. So this tells us that um, not only are hepatoblasts transcriptionally heterogeneous, they're also functionally heterogeneous. And even at 9.5, we found a proportion of hepatoblasts which are LGR5 negative and already pre-committed to the ductal fate. So this has opened up many more questions in liver development than it's answered. Um, and so we wanted to see if we could test the pot potential of these hepatoblasts in vitro. Could we make an in vitro model of liver development? So to do that, we isolated the embryonic livers, we isolated the LGR5 positive hepatoblasts, and tested them in different conditions to try and recapitulate um, ductal cells and hepatocyte cells. And what you can see here is that we were successful um, in seeding these hepat hepatoblasts and getting ductal organoids. You can see that based on the cyst-like structure and the single cell epithelial nature of them. And also hepatocyte organoids, you can see these are much denser structures than the ductal ones. 
Um, so that's based on morphology. Here you can see uh, more characterization. So you can see that the embryonic organoids express much higher levels of albumin. This is a hepatocyte marker, whereas the ductal organoids express much more keratin-19, which again is a ductal marker. We see that also at the protein level, so HNF4-alpha is a well-known hepatocyte marker that we see in the hepatocyte organoids. Again, keratin-19 you can see at the protein level and also at the functional level. So we see that the hepatocyte organoids express and secrete albumin. So in vitro, we can recapitulate this liver development from hepatoblasts to hepatocytes and ductal cells, um, and they uh, retain their self-renewal and differentiation capacity. So to summarize this developmental story, we see that hepatoblasts are actually transcriptionally and functionally heterogeneous. We find LGR5 is a marker of bipotent hepatoblasts in vivo. We've also identified an early ductal committed uh, subpopulation of hepatoblasts. And we now have an organoid system that can recapitulate hepatoblast differentiation in vitro. Um, and an important point here is that from one starting source, the hepatoblasts, we can make both ductal organoids and hepatocyte organoids. Um, and then the last few slides, I just wanted to talk a little bit about modeling liver diseases using liver organoids. Um, so a few years ago, it was shown that liver organoids could be used to model a monogenic disease, uh, A1AT. Um, and most so far, the diseases normally modeled by organoids have been these monogenic diseases. But recently, uh, work from the lab from Laura Brautier showed that she could also model acquired liver diseases, in this case, liver cancer, um, by taking the, a resection of the tumor in vivo and culturing that in 3D as tumoroids. So just to show you this, this, these are liver organoids, just normal healthy ductal ones. This is how the tissue looks. So you have this nice single cell ductal epithelial layer here. You see the organoids recapitulate that nicely. And there are three types of primary liver cancer. And you can see that for all three types, she was able to uh, form organoids from them. And you can see the difference in the histology from the tumoroids compared to the healthy organoids. Um, not only do they retain the histological architecture of the tumor of origin, they also recapitulate the expression profile. So here you can see the expression of the organoid is closest to its tumor compared to any other organoid line. Um, and they also recapitulate the genetic alterations. So if you look at the um, somatic variants, you actually find that 84% of them are kept in the organoids. So what can we do with these tumoroids? So she tested if they could be platforms for personalized drug testing. And what you see here are tumoroids from uh, the three types of liver cancer uh, from two different patients in each case using high throughput screening on different drugs. And what you can see is some drugs work maybe in one patient, but not in another. Um, so it kind of exemplifies of having patient-specific drug testing. And one uh, drug she identified was this ERK inhibitor, which hasn't been used for liver cancer previously. And as a proof of principle, Laura showed that by injecting the tumoroids into a mouse, uh, without application of this drug, the tumoroid grows into a tumor. Um, but if you do this injection and add the drug, the tumor reduces in volume. So it seems that in the case of primary liver cancer, tumoroids are amenable to high throughput drug screening, and they actually might provide a basis for drug testing in a patient specific manner. So with that, I'd just like to summarize about liver organoids. So originally we had the ductal organoids formed from the adult liver um, and that these could then be differentiated into hepatocytes and this was done for mice and human. More recently, hepatocyte organoids have actually been described from the Clever's lab and Roll Noose's lab. Um, in this case, they start from hepatocytes and make hepatocyte organoids. Um, and now we can use these systems to investigate different aspects of biology, such as developmental biology, where we can now produce both ductal and hepatocyte organoids from the same starting material. We can use them to look into homeostasis and regeneration and also disease modeling. 
This opens up avenues for personalized medicine, such as drug screening or to drug toxicity screening. And in the case of monogenic diseases, um, allows us a basis for regenerative medicine, where you can do autologous transplantation of um, organoids if you can correct these monogenic diseases using, for example, CRISPR-Cas9 technology. And with that, I'd like to thank uh, Mary Hook here and the whole Hook Lab. I especially want to mention Laura, who did the work on the tumoroids, Luigi, who did the work on the epigenetics, and Chris and Elena, who helped me with the developmental biology story. And with that, I'd just ask if there's any questions, or if not, you can always email me and ask me later. Thank you very much, Nicole. Um, so that's fantastic. So any questions, um, can you just post them in the, in the Q and A? Um, so we've got, we've got one here to start you off. Mm -hmm. um, so your organoids are self organizing while in a tissue context, the pressure in the duct will be a driving force for the organ growth. Uh, so do you really recapitulate the organ regeneration? Yeah, so in terms of cell composition, of course, there's many other aspects. Um, and the, the ducts in vivo can go very, very far, of course, whereas in vitro, our organoids can only get to a certain size before we have to split them and disrupt them. So in terms of sort of mechanistic uh, sizes and stuff, it's not the same, but in the terms of the transcriptional changes, and as you'll see from Luigi's paper, the epigenetic changes at the cellular level, it recapitulates it. Okay, uh, we've got a question um, from Mark Graham, who says, I saw some lovely histology. Uh, did you um, uh, immunofluorescence stain your organoid slash tumoroids? Yes, so if you look at the paper from Laura, uh, there's also immunofluorescence where she looks at their differentiation based on AFP and other markers. And you can see that the tumoroids, again, recapitulate that of their tumor of origin. Okay. Uh, a question from uh, Matthew Davidson uh, saying, is a 3D environment required for the differentiation of hepatocytes from uh, LGR5 positive hepatoblasts, or could this actually be just be done in 2D culture? Oh, I see what you mean. So if you had ductal cells in 2D culture and could you differentiate them? The thing I would say about that is it's actually very difficult to keep ductal cells in vitro. So for decades, people tried to expand ductal cells in vitro using 2D culture, of course, um, and it wasn't possible. And it was really the advent of the 3D method that allowed this expansion to be done long term. So maybe you could take a ductal cell and immediately differentiate it into a hepatocyte in vitro. I'm not sure. But if you want to do long term experiments, it wouldn't be possible. I guess did you did you spend time optimizing those two different culture medium media, um, and could you then apply those optimized media to the two D cultures? Yeah, it's hard to in two D culture if you see what I mean. So they don't last in vitro in two D. Sure, sure. Okay, so we've got a question from Sunak Sahu saying, great talk. Uh, how would you perform CRISPR-based genome editing uh, in organoids to ensure editing to happen in all cells in an organoid? That's a really good question. And actually, there was a paper by the Hans Clevers lab, I think maybe last month or two months ago, I think in March, in Nature Cell Biology, where they actually describe different CRISPR hot, they call it, methods in different organoid systems. But really, the main basis is you do your CRISPR with some sort of fluorescent tag attached so you can see which cells have incorporated this or not so you have to do cell sorting to find the cells that have actually been targeted that makes sense that makes sense and you touched on um so you touched on the developmental and then the personalized uh, screening aspects but could you talk a little bit more about the regenerative uh the homeostasis and the regeneration potential for these organoids yeah, so I think it was really based, the original adult liver ductal organoids were based on the regenerative phenomenon of the liver. 
Um, and so what's seen nicely there is that not only do you get this huge ductal response, you also get the subsequent differentiation into hepatocytes, depending on the culture medium, of course. Um, and then in the recent work from Luigi that I highlighted from last year, he actually looks at the epigenetic changes that are associated with that and the role of different modifiers such as TEP1. Okay, all right, thank you. I think we might have time for one more question. So Marco says, um, do you know if it's possible to deplete a target gene in cholangiocytes, cholangiocyte organoids? I mean, using, for example, single uh, short hairpin RNAs or sRNAs, then yes, you can do that for sure. All right, I think uh, it's probably time to wrap this up and um, I'm going to hand over to, well, first of all, thank you. Thank you, Nicole, for a fantastically clear talk. Uh, it was really interesting work. Um, and I'm going to hand over now to uh, Brian and he's going to introduce uh, Brittany. Thank you.